very happy to see all of you here this evening. Some familiar faces, some new faces. Some of our, uh, I think a couple of our speakers last year were also here, so very happy uh, to be back. We wish more uh, people will come. I hope some more people will come. Uh, last year, when we started uh, with this one series, uh, with a general theme in development in India, we have 15 remarkable scholars speaking about fields varying from economy to literature, the arts to public health, a, a, a variety of speakers. One thing that emerged from that series is when we are looking at development in these fields, you know, how we are progressing in this field, our own intention in creating this platform was to see how there can be a, how a horizontal kind of platform can be built so that different disciplines, different people can come together and think about the, the idea of development, uh, live more uh, uh, comprehensively. That was why this, uh, this series was conceptualized. Uh, but once the series was over and we reviewed the, the, the lectures, we found that one common thing that all the speakers pointed out is that there is a problem about, there is a lack of inclusiveness when you're looking about, when you're thinking about development in each of these fields. Uh, it, there is also, there are also discontinuities in these areas. Sometimes the planning and execution of uh, the processes are arbitrary. So uh, when we arrived at this critique of uh, the concept of development, models of development that we have, we thought that there has to be some way out, like you know, critiquing itself is not enough. You have to move forward and figure out uh, how do we negotiate this. We thought the, question, the, the basic question that we needed to address was that of governance, management of knowledge systems, etc. So one of our speakers, uh, Professor G.N. Devi, last year, uh, I had a conversation with him and he suggested that it, it, it may be a good idea to look at some areas which have survived, you know, uh, sustained themselves, the, survived the over a period of time they have survived, and to look at how they have coped, how they have uh, negotiated uh, problems, crises. So this series uh, stemmed from that initial conversation. I thank uh, Professor G. N. Devi for that initial spark. You know. uh, that was the beginning. And then we started looking at this. We thought there has to be, a, in order to have a balance of uh, ideas, balance of understanding of our times. We also need to really look at not just uh, discontinuities and you know, we, it's not just enough to critique and say that things are bad. Even the media, like you look at uh, the media spaces and uh, you get a feeling that things are so very bad. There are areas, there are fields in this, uh, in our country have been continuous. There are ordinary people who have been trying to uh, survive, you know, go through uh, various struggles in order to survive. So we thought it is very important to look at these practices, bring them together in a platform, I mean, on a, on a platform, within a frame, and see, uh, and make a statement, perhaps, towards uh, understanding uh, development as as an organic process, something which we have to look at our, in our own space and figure out clues for uh, creating an organic model of governance, of management of knowledge systems. That is how this series has come about. This year we have 14 speakers. Most, all of them, almost all of them are practitioners. They are not just scholars, they are practitioners. Um, so uh, we, we, we are, uh, if you have, you, you must have got the calendar, I would urge you to look at this series as, uh, you know, not 
not just these lectures is not just individual lectures special i mean people specializing in individual fields and they are coming and speaking please do not look at this as uh, individual lectures but this is a series conceived with a with a with an aim to make a people's movement a kind of understanding about how we can move towards a certain kind of organic model of uh, uh, governance and knowledge management. Uh, so we have uh, subjects ranging from puppetry to food to bronze to, you know, we have some of our speakers uh, here. So it's very nice, uh, very, for us it is a happy thing to see this fellowship, like you know, our, our earlier speakers are, I mean, they, they, it's not like they are, they are not looking at them, it is like I have a lecture so I go and speak and come back. It's not that way. So it, that itself, that fellowship itself is uh, for us a great uh, um, uh, you know, uh, thing of happiness. So now, uh, today we have uh, Edin Ku with us. Uh, we are also, uh, we are a translocal foundation. Our name is Leela Foundation for Translocal Initiatives. So it is not just enough for us to look at uh, you know, our own space, but to extend our space, uh, find linkages, connections. So Edin um, uh, is a truly multifaceted uh, you know, figure, I would say, uh, in Malaysia. He's one of the most significant contemporary voices in Malaysia, a poet, journalist, uh, uh, translator, uh, educator, conservationist. Uh, he's many things, and uh, he, he he does all these things remarkably well. So publisher, um, one thing that connects us very integrally with Edin's work is this multi-centered uh, 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 kind of functioning. There are various centers which uh, converge into some kind of, a, and it is tentative. There is no fixity about like this is what I'm going to do or this. It's an explorative it's a space for him, knowledge. So uh, that way we are very integrally connected to his work. Today he's going to speak. He has an organization called Pusaka, which is uh, uh, trying to document and protect uh, traditional arts in Malay. Um, uh, so uh, wonderful work. You must uh, look, the, look up the website and uh, details. YouTube videos are available, you must. Some of these things will be shown here. But, um, and his works, he's also politically engaged in terms of uh, thinking, uh, the politicization of Islam, and especially you know the situation in Malaysia, so he's, he's uh, very engaged uh, uh, in that space. Um, I, 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 he's a personal friend, a very dear friend, so it's, a, it's indeed a great pleasure Honor that he is here, and it's also that in you know, an organization like Leela that has uh, hardly any resources, it is because of uh, so many people who have shown their goodwill, sharing, giving that this organization is functioning and you know doing things like this. Um, if we were to really buy things or get things with money or power, it would not, it would not have been possible at all. It is. Edin, for instance, has planned his India trip around this uh, this lecture. We are also having a poetry reading, multicultural poetry reading with him tomorrow at the Santi Academy at 5.30. He must all, all come there also. So uh, we are indeed delighted that uh, Edin is with us today. And I welcome you, Edin. It's a pleasure. And uh, 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 Raj Lebran. Uh, He's a true friend of Leela because it was last year when we started this, he was at the inaugural. Uh, I said uh, he is indeed the prime mover of this, this series because he, he was the uh, director at that time. So we walked into his cabin after 15 minutes of interaction. He understood what we were trying to do. As total strangers, we came out as friends and we decided on this collaboration. And that is what actually moved this on. So uh, you, you, you know about him. He has been here. He has built this institution. So I don't have to really uh, introduce him. Uh, thank you very much for coming and being with us. And welcome. I welcome all of you.
uh, to this evening. I really hope uh, we have a wonderful uh, interaction after this. Please stay on for the interaction also because that is, uh, we have found that last year, uh, you know, the interaction session after the lecture, they were really remarkable and wonderful. So you must stay for that and encourage more and more people to come. We have, we are also very happy that all our partners, earlier partners like uh, the Caravan Magazine and Swecha are with us. It is also, as I said, the, uh, it gives us a great deal of happiness to, uh, to think of this fellowship as continuing. Uh, and I wish all the people who are coming into this space would stay with us, partner in this, this pursuit of knowledge. And uh, you know, in, in this effort, if we are able to spot some way of uh, negotiating the, the difficulties that we are facing these times, that would be good. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be here. Uh, I must uh, perhaps emphasize uh, how good a friend to Rizio I am because I didn't plan my trip around India um, for this. I came especially for this. Um, it's a great privilege always to speak in India. Uh, in culture, we have no debts or deposits. Uh, we have marriages and love affairs. 
and the love affair with uh, India and Southeast Asia has been a very long one uh, and often a very burdensome one, uh, especially particularly given the kind of cultural politics that has overtaken uh, Southeast Asia over the past 50 years since the coming of nationhood, uh, that cursed thing, the nation state, um, tends to debilitate uh, the kinds of uh, cultural lineages that we carry with us. And uh, as I unfold, as I speak about the work that I've been doing over the past 25 years, I'm 45 uh, in October, that's almost half my life now, um, you will hopefully be able to glean a sense of what the weight of history uh, plays upon uh, our contemporary consciousness uh, under the great shadow of, of the nation state uh, over the past uh, 50 years. The kinds of revisionism, the kinds of reconstruction that goes on of culture, uh, especially as reflected in the arts, um, that, uh, when that, that, that is forced to evolve, make certain adjustments uh, in confrontation with the exigencies of politics every single day. Uh, I thought I would provide a setting for what I'm going to talk about in the form of visuals. Uh, so I would like very much to uh, present just a series of photographs. Uh, we have very good phot photographers who, who work with us at Kusaka, and we've got a very small video of a, of a shadow play <coughs> performance. And just before I, I, I start that, I just want to say that uh, the traditional arts uh, of Malaysia uh, are very much still rooted in ritual. Uh, ritual as in they are still therapeutic healing forms of, of uh, theatre that involve things like uh, trans sessions, that involve uh, uh, healing dynamics, forms of psychotherapy as performed in, in theatre. And one of the main principles, one of the main reasons for the kinds of cultural problems it has led into, its confrontation with modern politics, its confrontation with uh, uh, national identity, its confrontation with religious politics in the form of a new Islamic revivalism overtaking not just Malaysia but also Indonesia and other parts of, of Southeast Asia, whereby the composite coming together of the various histories, of the various narratives, the various genealogies and lineages that comprise, uh, forge and continue to shape Southeast Asian culture has become uh, problematic especially in presenting a kind of monolithic and homogenous uh, identity. Identity is a term I loathe, uh, only because I simply cannot find myself, you know, pitting, putting myself in one identity or another, uh, since uh, um, I, I seem to comprise all kinds of composites. My father's Chinese, my mother's Indian, I work in a Malay environment, I'm a Hindu, I'm a you know, tantric, I'm all, all these various things. Uh, and I find the uh, suffocation that comes with uh, a very confirmed uh, identity uh, uh, structures uh, extremely stifling. Um, but perhaps you can start off uh, with, the, uh, with the visual presentation uh, for about five minutes. the demo because I have problems with my eyes and, and uh, uh, light. Uh, the first one, please. Uh, this will do. Um, on the left is the character Hanuman. Uh, Hanume, as he's known in uh, Tlantan, where this is uh, uh, formed. And on the right is Ravana, who is the kind of uh, strange anti-hero in the Malay uh, Ramayana. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, this is a group called Chinna Rasa Urmi Melum uh, Masana Kali. Uh, and they perform uh, the Urmi tradition, which is a tradition that is, uh, I suppose, uh, in India known as associated with, um, with uh, uh, the Dalit class uh, of people. They mainly... Uh, Kali devotees and uh, perform this very vibrant uh, temple drum tradition uh, known as the Urmu Melam, uh, which is also 
run into all kinds of cultural problems uh, with, the, with what we call the Vaishnavization of, uh, of Hinduism uh, in, in Malaysia, particularly among the working classes there. Uh, this is, her name is Mekja. She is a Mak Yong dancer. Uh, Mak Yong, the Mak Yong is a famous, well-known uh, psychotherapeutic uh, dance drama form performed solely by women. All the male roles are also performed by uh, women. Uh, Mekja is uh, a performer who comes from nine generations of uh, Mak Yong dancers. Uh, and the Mangyong normally ends with a trance session uh, in which uh, it is believed that all the pent-up emotions, pent-up emotional uh, stresses of particularly women uh, are let out uh, in the form of a uh, tiger trance. It is believed that a tiger spirit possesses these women uh, who then go into quite intense trance states. Uh, a lot of them actually very erotic and very sensual. There's a lot of sexual tension that's uh, released uh, in these sessions that normally last for an hour or two hours. Uh, this man is known as a Tok Putri, uh, or he's called the father of the princess. In a tradition called the Main Putri, uh, or in English, the play of the princess. This is a solely uh, psychotherapeutic uh, ritual performance done for the healing or the betterment uh, of uh, emotional stresses within patients. Again, uh, the majority of the patients who attend these uh, performances uh, are women. Uh, and again, the uh, onion or the wind that is invoked, the spirit that is invoked, is the tiger spirit, which is believed to liberate uh, people from uh, psychological stresses. Um, that's the end of the ritual, uh, in which the two women who have been the subject uh, of, this, of this performance are finally quelled, uh, the emotions are quelled. And it's very interesting what the, uh, the incantation that follows is uh, uh, that the uh, Toputri or the shaman uh, goes into a very uh, beautiful uh, poetic recitation uh, in quatrains actually, uh, that end with um, you are healed, but always with the addendum you are healed for now. Uh, before he lets the patients uh, go back into what they call normal life. Um, after the intensity of the performance, the shaman himself is normally overcome. And uh, um, uh, this is a, a, a scene of him essentially you know, towards the end, uh, almost fainting or almost uh, losing his, uh, his, his consciousness. Uh, this is a dikebara. A dikebara is a... Um, all-male musical ensemble consisting of uh, two lead singers who then perform with uh, normally two competing groups that range from 10 people to 30 people to 50 people or 100 people in competition. Uh, in the state we work with in Klantan, uh, Klantan is administered by the Islamic Party of Malaysia. It has been administered by the Islamic Party of Malaysia for close to Let's see, maybe, uh, close to 14 years, 14, 15 years now. And uh, um, this is one of the solely male traditions that exist uh, in that state. Uh, while it is not a matriarchal state, culturally, women have played a very dominant role uh, in, in Klantan. Uh, and uh, a lot of the art forms, even though performed by men, have a very strong feminine sensibility to it. Uh, there's this element of actually fighting your sexuality, especially in men, uh, in the state of Kuantan, uh, whereby all the aesthetic uh, requirements are very female and very feminine. This is the only male tradition, and there's a lot of testosterone that actually comes out in this thing, which can last sometimes up to five to six hours. Uh, next one, please. Uh, and this is just a very a nice image, I think, of the clappers. These are clappers, not unlike Kavali, except that they are a lot bigger. Uh, DK Bara, the word DK comes from ZK, uh, which is chant, of course. Uh, this is a very unique uh, tradition. This is called the Kuda Kapam. <coughs> and it's of Javanese origin. And it basically uh, takes its main subject, uh, a horse. Uh, not just any horse, but essentially the horse that, the spirit of the horse uh, upon which Imam Hussein. Uh, 
uh, read, uh, uh, wrote during the Battle of Karbala. Uh, as you know, uh, Southeast Asian Muslims are Sunnis. Uh, but there's a very strong Shia dimension uh, to a lot of the performing traditions uh, within uh, Sunni Sufi communities uh, in Malaysia and Indonesia. This is performed by essentially Javanese uh, immigrants who moved to Malaya in the 17th and 18th century, settled in the southern state of Johor, and these essentially are um, what you call uh, Javanese, uh, you know, people of a, a Javanese lineage. Uh, this is again to um, bring about the revitalization of the self uh, that is believed to come uh, from an invocation of Imam Hussein and more importantly, Imam Ali. Uh, yeah, and uh, there's a lot of uh, inducement of trance here, uh, using uh, kamanyan or incense, uh, and uh, the subjects or the performers usually perform quite incredible feats, uh, like walking on swords or uh, getting whipped and uh, breaking coconuts with their heads and uh, uh, eating glass is a very popular habit among, uh, among them. Uh, this is the, one of the first sessions of actually invoking the, the trance. Uh, this is a performer who has collapsed into a state of, uh, of ecstasy, uh, uh, reaching out essentially for the whip that he would uh, eventually take to flagellate uh, himself. Uh, and this is uh, one of the men who presides over, one of the elders who presides over the trance session. Uh, and uh, eventually attempts to drag the spirit uh, out of, of, of the boy uh, or the young man after he is left. Again, uh, this is not solely a male tradition. Uh, there are females who participate, and often more intensely than the males, uh, but it's uh, predominantly a male uh, tradition. Uh, this is Hanuman, just before uh, a ritual is done. This is known as the Burjamu. The Burjamu is a ritual performance done solely for the shadow play uh, and that is performed only three times in the lifetime of a puppeteer. Once when he graduates to be a full puppeteer uh, and can conduct uh, his entire, the, the entire performance by himself. Second, when he is regarded as something of a master puppeteer. And uh, then towards you know, the middle or later part of his life, uh, whereby he gives um, uh, due veneration uh, to the uh, puppets. Uh, I, I'll just say, uh, tell you a little anecdote about this. Uh, not the puppeteer here, but the, the puppeteer I actually started to work with, whose name was Abdullah Ibrahim, perhaps one of the great puppeteers of uh, Southeast Asia, a tiny little man of about five foot two. Uh, he was known as uh, the Dalang Samsing, or the hooligan Dalang in Klantan because he was known to perform very subversive uh, stories that uh, often uh, took pot shots at politicians and, and the political issues uh, uh, of the day. Uh, just before he died in uh, 2005, we organized a big pajamu for him. And what happens in the pajamu is that after the end of a three-night performance, and each performance in, 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 uh, in Klantan lasts for about six hours, from 10 to about 4 o'clock in the morning, on the last day, he will gather, get into uh, a, a, a trance, uh, whereby he basically absorbs the spirit of every single one of the main protagonists uh, of the play. At that instant, uh, the screen that has divided the Wayang world from the world of mortals is cut. And essentially, the Wayang then does not uh, separate itself uh, from uh, the, the whole world. And the Dalan then uh, continues to perform using the puppets yeah, until he throws them down on the, on the floor and does the movements himself uh, uh, as, as, uh, as a man. Uh, and he gets increasingly strong. And what was incredible was my Dalan was a 67 year old man, very tiny, very pleasant and, and you know, muscular, but tiny. And it took about 10 the large men to hold him back uh, when he was taking in the spirit of the jinn. Uh, quite an extraordinary uh, experience. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, that's the Dalang we work with now. His name is Dalang Saudi. 
Uh, it's quite interesting, and I'll talk about this a, a little later, about, uh, he's what you would call a literate Dalai. Uh, he can read and write. Uh, and he was a student of uh, Abdullah, Dalai Abdullah, who was an oral uh, puppeteer, who didn't read or write, uh, but whose uh, um, senses somehow, he, this guy is a great Dalai, don't get me wrong, but uh, what we've seen in the transition is that being literate, uh, does a lot to affect the senses uh, in the performance and the training of, uh, of, of shadow puppeteers today. Uh, again, this is at the end of uh, the performance uh, of the ritual, uh, whereby he is blessed. Uh, those are basically um, uh, rice, rice uh, harvest, uh, uh, full rice, things that, that is used to dispel any bad spirit of bad faith that has entered into the space. Uh, and that's the preparation. Uh, as you can see, there are offerings beneath, and the screen is, is, is cut, and the Dalang is ready to receive, essentially, the spirit of each of these uh, characters, or beings, uh, so to speak. Uh, we can just have a short video, uh, so that you can get a sense. Uh, now, before you play the video, uh, you get a sense of perhaps the music, uh, I think, is Crucial. The music is incredibly intense, uh, also very, very eccentric and very raw. Um, uh, in quite different, most people know the Indonesian wayang, which is highly classicized, highly formalized, and highly structured. Uh, what you will see with the Kantan wayang essentially is that it's a lot smaller, it's also a lot more uh, eccentric and erratic, and a lot more intense and, 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 and raw. Yes.
explained everything about uh, the Southeast Asian uh, entity. It is a paradoxical problem because it's not only a scholastic one. It has become a political one uh, in that uh, the generations that have taken over uh, um, the governance of these countries believe in that, um, in that uh, idea, uh, believe in that uh, postulation as much as those who pronounced it. Uh, so that a lot of the culture of Southeast Asia has been essentially institutionalized, uh, structured, uh, re-envisioned, uh, and uh, reconstructed uh, for essentially national purposes. So terms like national unity, terms like oneness, uh, terms like um, uh, culture for the propagation of uh, national oneness and national togetherness are very popular terms in both in countries like Southeast Asia, countries like Malaysia, particularly in Thailand, where you get the notion of Thainess wearing down very heavily. And anyone who doesn't, uh, who looks at the political situation in Thailand today, uh, will certainly be quite baffled uh, about uh, um, you know the, the various factions that are essentially fighting just for legitimacy, uh, let alone governance, uh, because Thailand has seen to be uh, completely monolithic. Uh, homogenous culture. What is very interesting at present and has been very interesting in Southeast Asia over the past 20 years is the basically the crumbling down of national identity, uh, the cynicism that has come to meet the nation state and essentially the lack of faith anymore in a history that we can call our own and more importantly in the processes uh, that allow us to independently explore uh, and excavate 
uh, our historical past. Uh, we are uh, not just in Southeast Asia, but everywhere in the world, looking for answers, uh, as you said. Um, but I think we're too preoccupied uh, with looking for answers, because I don't think there are any. Uh, and I think the search is a very crucial one, because we are coming to a kind of final Yeah. Uh, upon which we seem to desperately need to return to fundamentals and ask a very serious whys about just about everything, uh, uh, really. Uh, when I came into this work, uh, looking at ritual traditions, uh, Malaysians were not bothered, essentially, about something like this. Um, this exists in a very rural part of uh, Malaysia. It exists in a state called Kelantan, which is on the border to Thailand, uh, which is 93% Malay, Muslim, uh, and is seen to be backward, primitive, underdeveloped, with an economy not worth speaking of. They even speak a dialect of Malay that nobody else uh, in the peninsula understands. Uh, and a lot of what is seen here today exists in the popular imagination of most Malaysians even if they have come from rural backgrounds, in the realm of sentimentality and nostalgia, as having very little to tell us, essentially, about our contemporary uh, predicament and our contemporary problems, in particular in relation to politics, religion, and interplay of all these things. In 23 years, uh, I am happy to say that there has been a very gradual and slow and at times begrudging acknowledgement that it's to things like this we need to go to understand the incredible fabric that has made up the culture of Malaysia. And by extension, uh, the incredible kinds of experiments and confluences, uh, river rhymes and you know, all kinds of uh, interesting uh, allusions and coming togethers that make up what we understand today as multiculturalism. Uh, in the course of my work, I had no references at home. My references essentially were competitive and, you know, for want of a better word, foreign. Uh, countries like India, uh, one of the great uh, uh, intellectual sources and forces in the shaping of my work, just in the very methodology of how to do this thing, was A.K. Ramanujan uh, in ways of thinking. Is there an Indian way of thinking? Incredibly provocative questions. I had to look to Indonesia, of course. Uh, in a very different dimension, uh, look at contemporary theatre practitioners, many of whom were educated in the West, in Holland or in the United States, who returned home in search of shamans, in search of ritualists, in an attempt to create an authentic or a viable con a language for contemporary uh, Indonesian theatre. Uh, you even look in a, to a place like the Caribbean, that produced a person like Derek Walker. Uh, and the Caribbean, the cultural essence of the Caribbean is not unlike Southeast Asia, uh, a history of basically uh, you know, migrant, immigrant communities, a history of indentured labor, a history of uh, basically agriculture for the empire. Uh, and I'm always very fond of uh, recalling what Derek Walker said about um, the Caribbean and the problem of shaping a language for the Caribbean. You know, we are a country without a history, mongrelized, polyglot, yeah. a country without a history like heaven. Um, <clears throat> and that is essentially the cultural landscape uh, that uh, I represent uh, within my own family. As I said, my father is Chinese, uh, my mother is Indian. We are minority communities within Malaysia. Uh, and even within the minority communities, we are further minorities. Uh, my father is a Chinese of what they call Peranakan ancestry, uh, very early Chinese immigrants who basically forsook uh, any claim to Chineseness. They dressed in Malay, they ate Malay food, uh, and they spoke Malay. Uh, my mother is a fourth generation Tamil, uh, but not from the Indian mainland. She's from Sri Lanka, uh, from Jaffna, uh, from a village called Batakote, and uh, Prabhakaran is the seventh cousin of mine. <laughs> Uh, uh, so we gravitate in those uh, kinds of, uh, that is the cult cultural landscape uh, that uh, we represent. And for a long time, the debate has been about 
what kind of legitimacy do you have being contained these kinds of multitudes, whether you have anything uh, at all to say. 20 years since this work began, uh, we begin to see that the importance of what you call minority voices, of accidents of history, of eccentricities of history, are uh, more relevant today than ever before. And that there is a real need uh, to, to explore uh, all of them. Southeast Asia, as you know, uh, is seen uh, by, and has been seen for a very long time in intellectual terms, as being essentially a very placid uh, you know, region, a very placid landscape where nothing really happened. Uh, where you had a long period of animism, and then you had a long period of Hinduism, uh, that, and, uh, and then Hindu-Buddhist rule, that produced incredible monuments like Angkor, like Bagan, uh, like Borobudur, uh, all parts of Greater India, uh, who were either, if they were to claim to have any culture at all, were essentially offsprings of Ramayanic and Mahabharata cultures, uh, and then, of course, the coming of Islam to uh, island Southeast Asia and the permanent uh, settling of Buddhism uh, in, in, in mainland uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, that is not true, actually. Uh, Southeast Asia did not evolve, evolve in waves. Uh, it was a highly fractious uh, uh, region uh, in which fratricide, civil war, uh, and uh, um, eccentricities of the great culture, interpretations of great cultures uh, were very, very dynamic. Uh, and that the need to look at the dynamism of this kind of eccentricity um, has been a very recent one. Let's look at the Ramayana as an example. Malaysia is a Ramayanic part of the Ramayanic culture. Indonesia is very much more a Mahabharata culture. Uh, and as you know, Krishna, Arjuna, Bhima, Bisma, and everybody have very prominent roles to play in Indonesia. And there is no understanding Indonesian politics, for example, if you do not understand the Mahabharata and the dynamics of intrigue and uh, uh, political, open political warfare, silent political warfare. It's all shaped around uh, um, uh, the Mahabharata. Sukarno himself often identified himself with Krishna. Uh, a very thin Krishna. And he always talked about you know, small waist, uh, which meant refinement and beauty. Uh, in Malaysia, whenever I talk about the Malay Ramayana in India, uh, people are scandalized uh, because the eccentricities are just far too abominable sometimes. Uh, and even within the region, of course, in countries like Cambodia, you have a very uh, reverential approach to the Ramayana. In Malaya, among the Malays, it is a lot more human. Let me tell you a few stories, uh, for example. Rama is not seen as, an, as a hero. Uh, he is the main protagonist, but he is not seen as a hero. He seemed to be extremely vainglorious and egotistical. The hero is really an anti-hero, uh, and that is Ravana. And uh, the Ramayana, as we know it in, among the Malays, is not called the Ramayana. It's not called the Epic of Rama. It is called the Epic of Ravana, Hikayat Maharajavana. And uh, uh, here, uh, too, there are interpretations that are very bizarre. Uh, the Ramayana is very much performed as a storytelling tradition. And puppeteers essentially are masters of the Ramayana. My puppeteer, for example, had very individualistic tastes. Uh, of course, he performed the Ramayana as it was, as it was, but he was also allowed very often to interpret stories. A master dalang among the Malays is someone who can create stories out of stories. So you have something called the Chirita Poko, which is the trunk story. And any Dalang who continues to perform the trunk story for the rest of his life, he seemed to be a pretty worthless Dalang. How many times can you know, go on with this? Uh, you are instead encouraged to create what you call Charitarante, or branch stories. Branch stories that help you to express your individuality, express your temperament, and through that, become a general, uh, 
allow all of that to become the channel for your ingenuity and genius. There's a great belief in genius among these um, the village communities. It is that genius that brings about healing, for example, among foreign individual or within the community uh, or within the world at large. Village okay? uh, um, property is thinking very big, very, very big grand terms. Um, now, Dara Abdullah, whom I worked with, the hooligan Dara, as I said, uh, had a very strong attachment to Ravana. Uh, he had an almost erotic attachment to Sita, or as we call, call her Sita Devi, in the way he just handled the puppet, in the way he would stroke her and things like that. Uh, and uh, a really very contemptuous uh, attitude towards Rama, uh, Rama, whom he would just he would just fling the, <laughs> the puppet uh, all over all over the place. Now again, this scandalizes uh, uh, people. In his version of the Ramayana, Rama does not win. Rama loses; he's defeated. You know, and the monkey army, uh, uh, whom we all love, but they are defeated and they are, they they go into a deep depression. And uh, Ravana <laughs> carries off. Uh, Sita, and uh, there is a scene where uh, he she, she he brings her into his antechamber, into his room, and they go into this, in this incredible scene in which he professes his love for her in songs and uh, in poetry again quatrains, and there's a moment when uh, Sita is ambivalent about her loyalty and her fidelity, and she begins to understand that. Uh, uh, loyalty and real feeling are completely different things. Uh, and there's an instant when he comes to embrace her. Uh, and it is at that moment that she, she, she gains her awareness again. And what she does is she takes out her hairpin and she stamps it. And that is how Ravana, in the Malay version of this particular Dalan, dies. Yeah. Uh, and then we know the story of how she goes back and she's not trusted. And of course, the worst of Rama comes out in all of, 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 that, of that play. Hanuman is also a very interesting story. Hanuman is not a devotee of Rama in the Malay Ramayana. He is the son of Rama. And this is what happens. Um, uh, Rama and Sita are taken very ill. And they are informed by the Maharishi. The Maharishi essentially is the sage. Uh, to go and look for a certain kind of herb. Uh, and Lakshmana, of course, always upright and always, you know, just uh, uh, very morally, very sound, um, uh, decides to lead them. Uh, except it comes with a warning. The Maharaj says, as you go along, you may go for two days, you may go for two weeks. Whatever happens, don't drink any water. Uh, and they go for this walk, and they begin to get very thirsty, uh, Rama and Sita, and they see a lake. And uh, immediately, of course, they don't think of the words of the Maharishi. They plunge straight into the, and drink the water. And what happens is that they turn into monkeys. They turn into apes. And what do apes do? Apes copulate. Uh, and so they go on a tree and they copulate. And uh, you know, finally, um, Lakshmana is able to trap them, bring them down. You know, after a few mantras, and they're back into the original form. Except that she is still pregnant. And they return home, and then, of course, uh, Rama is tortured tortured because he can't have an ape son, he can't have a monkey son, that's just impossible. And so he calls the handmaiden of Sita, and he tells her to abort the baby. And so she goes into this big process of massaging the stomach, you know, massaging the stomach, uh, until the baby falls out in the form of a pinang seed. Uh, what's pinang? Pinang is what in uh, English? It's a, it's a kind of uh, fruit and seed, very popular in, in, in there. And the baby is contained in the seed. Uh, the handmaiden, on the other hand, is too guilt-stricken to actually kill the baby or you know, bury the seed or whatever it is. She puts it into her own mouth and uh, gives birth nine months later to an ape son. That ape son is Hanuman. Uh, the rationale, of course, is that uh, as Muslims, um, the Malays cannot worship uh, uh, Rama. But uh, they need to explain what this devotion is. And the only way they can explain it, of course, is that it is a filial devotion. It is a devotion of a son to his father. And uh, that's how the story unfolds. And that's the genealogy uh, of Hanuman, Rama, and Sita in the Malay Ramayana. So again, as I say, uh, incredibly, incredibly eccentric, 
Uh, and of course, varieties exist according to each storyteller. You know, they, they, they take stories uh, wherever they, they uh, want to go. The journey of the Ramayana itself to Malaya has been very interesting. Uh, the origins are probably Orissa, or Kalinga, as we refer to early India, Kalinga, uh, often. And the Ramayana that came uh, to Malaya most likely came by foot. Uh, and went through a whole period through Cambodia, Burma, to Thailand, and then down, forging what I call the Ramayani crest that ended literally at the South China Sea at the point of Tlantan. And uh, the tradition then we, that we inherit, the Malay Muslim in Malaysia, essentially is a Buddhist Thai Cambodian tradition uh, from the north because the proximities are, 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 are that, that close. Uh, once you begin to unfold and once you begin to interrogate these kinds of histories, of course, borders and identities become completely baffling, if not stupid. Uh, yeah? And till today, even if you look at the puppets uh, there, you will see that the headgear is a Thai Khmer headgear. It is not the headgear that you see in Indonesia. And many people make these parallels because Indonesia is largely Muslim, Malaysia is largely Muslim, so they must be one and the same of each other. Well, that's not the case at all. Uh, it's actually the culture of diaspora uh, is a lot more intriguing and a lot more problematic than is uh, uh, perceived. Um, so the Ramayana is performed in this kind of way and always has been. So it's very hard to point to a definitive trunk story uh, of the Ramayana or say this is really the Malay uh, of the Ramayana. And what we've tried to do is really to collect as many as we can. Difficult now, of course, because people are passing and they have not passed down many of those uh, stories. Uh, and it's also very interesting because the puppeteers themselves begin to be identified with particular characters. Uh, so if you get a puppeteer, and in fact in the training of a puppeteer, at the end of your training, you will be given a, what you call a sacred puppet, a puppet that is not ever performed, but is always by the side of you, wrapped in a yellow cloth. Uh, and essentially, your individuality comes from that puppet, your character. That is something that you need to, 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 to play off. So my uh, Dalang Abdullah um, uh, had as his sacred puppet one of the Hanuman puppets uh, who was extremely naughty and mis mischievous. Uh, others have Rama, others have Ravana, others even have the jinns and so on. Uh, as their principal uh, um, characters. And this is how the puppet tradition uh, has evolved. It is still highly ritualistic and thrives off essentially two very important belief systems that exist not just in Kalanta, but more generally among the Malays, more generally among many Southeast Asians, and really quite generally in, in the world. And essentially, it's located in two things. There are two concepts that dominate the notion of the self. Uh, they are the theater, ritual theater, very closely related to metaphysics. Uh, notions of being, notions of the self. Uh, in the sense that it is believed that everybody possesses a certain kind of spirit, which is called samana. And that spirit is animated by different winds that flow through us. Uh, it is believed that there are 99 different winds that flow into ev through every single indi individual. Not every 99 of them, 99 being of course the 99 names of God, as you find in uh, Islam. Uh, but of course not all 99 are, are dominant. There will be two or three that are dominant, and these will influence essentially your character, your personality, and your temperament. Uh, what is believed to happen is that our individuality is constantly compromised because we live in society and we live among communities. And so the natural self, the innate self, has always got to be suppressed to accommodate living in a wider uh, community. And what this does to us, of course, is it makes us ill. It makes us depressed. Uh, it makes us feel down. Uh, it makes us suffer all kinds of emotional stress. When this happens, uh, you need to create a performance space uh, for release or the bus. Right? 
uh, and your response essentially the inner self's response to particular types of music to particular types of performance to particular types of performance archetypes and characters are things that help generate the movement of the wings again into a final release or a, or a trance session that will help you heal for that time. So performance space is regarded very much as a space for release and a space for healing that comes about with the regeneration uh, of, uh, of the wing. Uh, this, in a nutshell, essentially, is what happens. It gets a lot more elaborate, and you know, we could be here for the next, you know, 35 years talking about these uh, uh, things. Uh, but let's uh, drag it back uh, to the theme here that we're talking about, which is continuity. Puppetry as a paradigm of, of continuity. Uh, in an age, anyone who knows of Malaysia probably knows Dr. Mahadev. Uh, probably knows Malaysia's great industrialization uh, project and its economic prosperity and tiger of this and tiger of that and lion of this and lion of that. Uh, not so much anymore. Um, and when we're talking about continuity, when we're talking about uh, a certain viability to cultures, uh, where in the world does this fit in? Uh, very interesting because one of the things that has uh, many of these traditions have suffered from is that there has been very little, almost no, real intellectualization of these uh, traditions. Uh, they, they are seen as song and dance forms, essentially. That uh, you know, they, they represent a particular kind of culture that expresses particular kinds of things without viewing it within the broader fame, framework of our own historical uh, evolution uh, and also the notions of of belief systems and, and, and symbolic systems uh, that really dominate um, um, Malay life in that area. Um, there have also been problems, of course, with uh, the exigencies of politics, as I said, uh, over the past years, in particular with the new forms of identity uh, that seem to be very crucial uh, to the very young Malaysian nation. We are only 50 years old. Uh, as you know, Malaysia is a highly racialized society. Uh, we are demarcated by race. Our politics is distinguished by race. Uh, political parties are basically uh, organized according to race. That has changed a, a little, uh, but only in form, not in substance. Uh, and um, there has been this need, for example, to create monoliths even among the, 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 the races, Malay identity. Chinese identity, Indian identity, and others. And then, of course, there are bastard identities like mine, which fit nowhere, and you know, be kind of seen as, as, as really one of those eccentric, marginal people who really have no relevance uh, to the greater scheme of things. Which is quite interesting, because it has also allowed me uh, to do pursue the work that I do, um, which is has required uh, not only knowledge and exploration and travel, but also you have to be very strategically smart. Right? Uh, and I'll tell you why. The reason essentially is that um, our politics is dominated today by religion, uh, by Islamic revivalism, Muslim revivalism. I don't like to use the word Islam because Islam is a religion, it's abstract, it's a faith. Uh, Muslims, on the other hand, are very real, and, and they, they, you know, their practice is, is the practice of Muslim politics is, is very different. Um, and let me just give you a brief sense of how Muslim revivalism transpired in Malaysia. The Malays are a diasporic people. Uh, we are a small country of 32 million people. 60% of those people are Muslims, Malay Muslims, uh, and uh, they are differentiated according to region uh, and state, historical experience, uh, Javanese immigrants, Sulawesian immigrants, immigrants on the Moluccus, immigrants in South Thailand, who all come down to make this composite called the Malay. The Malay, in fact, is a term that was bequeathed by British colonists in the 1920s. There's a book called Papers of Malay Subjects written by R.J. Wilkinson, 
and Arvo Winston, who eventually founded the School of Oriental and African Studies, my alma mater. Um, and essentially, it was an attempt to begin to structure what was essentially a diasporic Malay culture in political terms, right? in an attempt to distinguish them with large scales of immigrant communities who were coming in, namely the Chinese uh, and the Indians, to essentially to create a political body, body politic known as the Malay. That is what the Malayan nation, the Malaysian nation, has inherited. And that has only accentuated in time. Uh, regionalism had to be transcended. Uh, dialects in language had to be transcended. Uh, state identity, uh, historical identity had to be transcended. So the Malays essentially were just this abstraction called the Malays, whose only sense of identity came essentially from the political process. Today, if you ask students, I teach at the university, I ask my students who come from the West Coast, or the East Coast, the North, the South, uh, who represent very different linguistic experiences, very different cultural experiences, very different historical differences. If you ask them, what are you? They will say, I'm Malay. And if you ask them again, what does that mean? They can only give you a constitutional definition. They cannot give you a cultural definition uh, at all. And when I teach one of the main things that I have to do is break down this kind of identity fortress. And you do that really with culture. This is where culture becomes dangerous and culture becomes subversive. And this is where culture and puppetry and ritual gives you an insight into what continuity. And by continuity, I suppose here we mean memory and commemoration of that memory. Um, in the 1970s, the Malay identity was not enough to differentiate the hegemonic community over the you know, minority communities. Uh, it was also a time when uh, we saw nationalism of all kinds um, basically disappoint. Uh, General Nasser had been defeated in uh, the Arab world. Uh, Israel had overcome the Arab armies. There was a great disillusionment with, uh, with secular national politics. And uh, there were, of course, people who were beginning to think in trans-global ways. Some of them very influential and very brilliant thinkers. Ali Shariati in Iran, uh, for example. Uh, um, people like uh, Ismail Farouki in uh, Egypt. And they began to have a huge influence in places like uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. One of the reasons for that, of course, is that given the cultural landscape that I was talking about, Muslims in Malaysia and Indonesia for a very long time have never ever felt Muslim enough, if you know what I mean. Never ever felt Muslim enough. Uh, one of the great books that reflects this, of course, is Among the Believers by B.S. Naipaul. Of course, we have problems with Naipaul's temperament say very good things about people and all that, but his grasp of the great cultural uh, dynamic of Southeast Asia in that book was very, very great. He wrote that book, of course, in the 1980s, after the Iranian Revolution. He traveled to all those non-Arab Muslim countries, who essentially dominate the Muslim world. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, but have never been able to shake off the shadow of Arabism. Arabism kind of, you know, the need for a puritanical uh, uh, identity. And of course, Naipaul was able to predict that the main problems for many of these countries uh, would be culture expressed in politics. By the 1970s, Malaya and Indonesia had been hit by this wave uh, of uh, the ideolo ideologization of uh, Islam. Uh, Mus um, Malay Muslims, Indonesian Muslims, uh, extremely interesting. The historical experience of Islam in Southeast Asia is extremely interesting. One, Islam did not arrive in these shores at the point of the sword. It arrived in waves from the 9th to the 15th century. One of the very interesting processes that has been going on in Southeast Asia is to try and pinpoint a very particular period at which Islam arrived in Southeast Asia. 
it has gone to nonsense extremes where they actually create a particular point and, and say Islam came here at this time and after that, after that we were all, 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 all Muslims. Uh, this is not the case. It was also, Islam also came to Southeast Asia from a variety of sources, from China, from India, from the Middle East, but even in the Middle East, from a very interesting and eccentric uh, community of peoples, the Gulf Arabs, seafaring people, not desert people. Uh, and this created a very interesting uh, fabric. They were also brought by Shafi'ites. And Shafi'ites, of course, were basically wanderers and traders. And, uh, and of course, they brought Sufism. And what Sufism did was it settled very nicely in what were already the cultural foundations of Southeast Asia, this strange and mixture of animism and Hinduism and Buddhism and you know King deification and all that. And uh, uh, what happened was basically a process of what I call accretion and secretion took place uh, with Islam. And this went on for centuries and centuries and, and, and centuries until, of course, religion encountered uh, 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 politics. Um, this accentuated in the 1970s, particularly among the uh, after the Iranian Revolution, uh, and when a firm uh, Muslim identity needed to be established. Now, the Iranian Revolution did a very interesting thing to most of the Muslim world. First of all, it inspired uh, many Islamic movements, uh, the Muslim youth movement in Indonesia, for example, uh, in, in Malaysia, for example, led by Anwar Ibrahim at, the, at that time, uh, in Indonesia, and so on. It began to take a uh, great, um, uh, it became a great, great wave in most, most uh, places in the Muslim world. Uh, until the establishment, uh, the Sunni establishment, uh, began to get into a state of panic of this pervasive Khomeinism. Mm -hmm. And what they did, of course, was to turn to Saudi Arabia for resources, for money, for scholarships, for the opening of borders, to basically bring waves of students uh, from countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Pakistan, everywhere to study, and essentially the process of Wahhabization uh, began. And uh, once these scholars went back, uh, the institutionalization of Islam, uh, devoid of any kind of historical context, began to take place. And essentially what we in Malaysia call the halal haram culture, uh, basically settled in the culture of Sharia above and beyond everything else. So no need for a memory, no need for an exploration of history, all we need is the law yeah, that has perpetuated and then climaxed and culminated, uh, of course, in the in late 80s and late 90s in the actual administration of government. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the absorption of Islamic values under Dr. Mahadev, for example, the creation of various Islamic institutions. And um, uh, in, in intellectual, uh, on the intellectual front, uh, basically the reconditioning and reconstruction of knowledge yeah, to present a particular kind of bias, a particular kind of clarity, and a particular kind of cleanness, actually, of our history and our, our, our past. Uh, this was a very um, crucial thing that happened in Southeast Asia. It culminated uh, in the work that I'm doing in 1990 when the Islamic Party took over the state of, of, of uh, Kelantan and essentially issued uh, a series of proscriptions. So what you have just seen and the work I do has been proscribed for 25 years. It's bad. Uh, we perform it, we do it, we don't hide it. It's some is that, it's underground, but it's done over, over the top. Uh, and uh, I, will, I will end with this. Uh, and, uh, Essentially, all these uh, traditions were banned. The shadow puppet tradition was summarily cast as Hindu, not Indian, but Hindu, uh, and that all practitioners of shadow puppeteers were, of shadow puppetry were polytheists and heretics. And of course, we live in an age of the soundbite, huh? so nobody has time to listen to Edin Ku elaborate about the history, you know. But the moment they hear Heretic politics, you know, the mind is already um, one of the problems of modernity, language, and the shortness of language. We have become stutterers these days. We don't, we don't speak, we stutter. 
Um, so that was one of the things. The Mat Yong was banned because it, it was performed by women, and women cannot be seen on stage. This is in Klantan, where even the entire myth of that state is rooted in, 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 in women. Uh, the Mayan Putri couldn't be performed because there was no time to explain psychotherapy and the beings of the self and Freudian this and that, because essentially the Mayan Putri was the invocation of devils and jinns. So that was out. Um, and on the more, on, in the center in Kuala Lumpur, of course, there was very little of a response. Because what had happened for, you know, since uh, independence was an institutionalization of culture. Uh, so you had Shadow Puppetry performed, but it was museumized, put in universities, uh, told to get rid of all dialects, don't speak in dialect, uh, you know, don't perform rituals. Uh, the bureaucratization of culture didn't do anything right, to help the argument for culture by the time bans and proscriptions were uh, imposed upon them. Uh, that's when I started uh, with my work in Klantan, uh, just going essentially as a political journalist at that time. I understood what was happening, and essentially what was happening was to create entire generations of people who have no memory. And when you have no memory, all you have is politics. Friends in Turkey have been telling me this ever since the uh, Edward came to power, you know, um, very much a Democrat, but look at the subtle, thing, subtle things that are going on in schools, in textbooks, right? the reconstruction of uh, just about uh, everything. Uh, so this has been our fight. What is continuity in these terms? Continuity is continuity for our sanity. Just simply to be able to remember and through remembering to explore. Uh, I end on a positive note. I mean, the, 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 the struggle has been a very interesting one because it has been, on the one hand, highly intellectualized, the gleaning of uh, you know, these, these kinds of strange bastard histories and putting them all together and making sense of them. It has also been structural and institutional. I was just telling uh, Suprita that Suprita and I were long friends 12 years, 15 years, uh, and I met her when I was starting my first book. Uh, it's been 12 years, it's not done yet. Mm -hmm. uh, because I've been trying to build an, uh, an organization and that requires structures and funding and you get into all that kind of thing. The third, of course, has been political. How to you know, strategize this work. Uh, I have the benefit of being a Muslim scholar. My first degree was in Islamic thought, Islamic philosophy. So I can argue with Islam. I can argue with Islam. Uh, secondly was to essentially dedicate your life for 25 years working at the grassroots level. Because I couldn't shoot in and shoot out and gain the trust and the, uh, uh, the solidarity of uh, the communities I was working with. But what I discovered when I did begin and you know, after a period of time was that culture is far stronger than politics. And if you know how to strategize things, uh, then you're able to subvert laws and dictums. Uh, not all conditions are the same. I, I'm not saying I can do the same thing with Boko Haram, okay? But I can do it with the Islamic, uh, you know, Islamic party of, of uh, Malaysia. Uh, but what I discovered, of course, that was that culture, and in particular with this society, theater, culture, performance, art, poetry, music, uh, they weren't just uh, you know, it wasn't just performance and art, song and dance. It really was a yearning. Mm -hmm. And that people perform this because there is a need and there is a, 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 a yearning. And what that helped to do was, of course, subvert the various policies that had been uh, introduced. We use a lot of politics. We use the newspapers, of course, to shame the government now and again. Uh, and uh, there was a nice story that appeared in the AFP today about shamanism. Uh, but after 25 years, we also discovered that there's great disillusionment and a sense of emptiness, hollowness, and a sense of void that exists among uh, this, not just this performance community, but within the community, the Malay community as, at, at large, who are seeking, for example, for a bigger history, for a bigger place and a bigger location, uh, uh, and a more meaningful, uh, wonderful term there, a more meaningful sense of self, and this, uh, realization that for 25 years, 30 years, 40 years, 
through the reconstruction of politics and reconstruction of religion, that they really have no sense of who they are uh, or where they come from. So what does this all mean? It means a great many things. It means a great many things about history. Uh, it means a great many things about how we need to reinterpret our approach to history. Uh, because uh, the Malays and the Asians as, at, at large, we're mythical people. We're not historical people, we're mythical people, but we fail to be able to read myth and to understand what it's uh, all about. That is a requirement. Uh, symbols become hugely important. Uh, uh, psychology becomes hugely important. And the realization that uh, most of our problems are political, but essentially they are cultural and psychological problems that are very, very much uh, rooted in, in uh, a historical uh, self. Um, you know, I, I began with a foreigner, so I will also end with a foreigner. Uh, do we have questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I always, uh, I love this quote. Uh, I, I began with a foreigner, and with an Irishman, actually. Uh, Eugene O'Neill. You know what he said about the past? There is no thing, there is no thing as the future. There is only the past happening over and over and over again now. And that's been my lesson. Thank you. comforting to see that uh, governments are actually uh, trying to direct the cultural traditions and limit them. Even democracies do that uh, wherever they feel uncomfortable. And they, perhaps we are in, a, in strange times when the history is being limited to very recent occurrences, you know, so maybe 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and uh, it's getting wiped out in the memory of uh, the newer generations. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, I think uh, we have 10 minutes because the uh, talk was so wonderful and so fascinating and held a spellbound. Uh, one couldn't uh, sort of uh, shorten it in any possible way. So let's spend the next 10 minutes maybe and if you have comments or questions, kind of keep it brief and short and you can get some more of uh, the brilliance out of Edin by your Yes, please. Speak, uh, you know, Sukhup. Some of us here have been really, really, very concerned about the cultural complexity that you talk about, which is obviously not at all limited to a Malay situation, because we have a lot of Malays within India, as you might understand by what, you know, by what I mean. I mean, in the context of how the, the so-called eccentricities of history happening here in so many places and how we also are kind of under a lot of pressure about this whole question of nation state, etc., etc. Anyway, I think I, I'm very intrigued with the point that you made, which I'm kind of wanting to understand a little more. You talk about how, you know, the literate uh, puppeteer uh, is, is different from, and how that kind of qualifies the quality of imagination, in one sense, of the puppeteer. I can understand, but I want to understand, I mean, I want to understand basically uh, how the difference comes in, but so that's one. But I'm also wondering, if we are on the one hand talking about it in this fashion, as to how literacy affects, you know, the reading and writing might affect the, the fluidity of imagination, in one sense, of the puppeteer. On the other hand, you're talking about lack of intellectualization. I worry about that. Isn't that, in a way, perhaps it's very good that that has been happening, intellectualization, because that again is presentation of certain kind of structures and, you know, frames, unless, of course, we are able to maintain the eccentricity as eccentricity, and I value that. This 
some. Yeah. Uh, well, very quickly, um, intellectualization. I, 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 I'm not a practicing puppeteer myself. Uh, I've learned it, and I like to do some puppetry, but I do very different things. Uh, you know, I like to do Samuel Beckett, for example, in shadow puppets, make my own shadow plays, and, and, and become a theater person. Uh, I don't. I, I can't perform this culture that comes from the earth. You know, it's with the, from the people. I talk about the intellectualization as I think there's a division of labor that comes with this kind of work. Uh, I don't, uh, it's not necessary for the performer himself to intellectualize the tradition. But there, have, there has to be people like me who do it. Uh, we've not had that done in Malaysia for 40, 50 years. Or if, if it was done, it was done very badly. And for also a particular kind of political purpose, which I think has been very destructive. Um, that kind of intellectualization uh, must take place, and everybody works in, its, in their own components or in this division uh, of labor. I'm not saying that the puppeteer can't want to intellectualize his own traditions. He can. Uh, um, there's no stopping that. But I think, for the moment, I'm talking about essentially various forces coming together uh, to work that on various uh, fronts. Uh, one of the things I've tried to do, of course, also with uh, our organization is to uh, draw in and attract a lot of uh, contemporary theater practitioners, dancers, and so on, who have no roots, yeah? who have no um, uh, connection with this kind of traditions, to begin to uh, look at these traditions, return to them, and see how it influences their own works, yeah? uh, in terms of methodology, in terms of, uh, of, of, of sensibility, and, and, and so on. Um, what I found working with practitioners, as I said, I was, you know, I, I was fortunate to have been essentially the last person to work with, uh, in Platan I work in five different forms, five principal forms. And I began my work with essentially the masters of these forms. They were the last ones remaining, one, 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 so five different masters. They've all passed away in the past uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, I found in them essentially all oral people, they couldn't read or write. Uh, I found that uh, uh, orality uh, brought about a kind of cohesion of the senses that the intellect, intellect was more pervasive hmm, throughout and more organic. Uh, what I find with succeeding generations is that it's very brain-centric. That's what I'm talking about. You know, there is uh, less attention. Uh, a puppeteer would basically feed off every single thing, you know, the trees, the environment, nature, sound of a car, you know, he would come to KL and make very quirky jokes about how we modern people live. Uh, I don't find that in, in essentially a lettered puppeteer who's very focused on story, evolution of story, and, and, and as a result, is less able to gather very eccentric things and allow spin-offs to happen in performance. I find myself getting a lot more bored these days than I used to be 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah. And it's not just because I'm older, I think it's because the quality of the performance really has changed. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, my name is Yuchin Okorokwa from Nigeria, and I'm Delhi University. Thank you for your presentation. I was actually head spread round and there. Uh, I felt like uh, you should not uh, end your presentation. Very interesting day. Um, public uh, traditional presentation uh, is not so popular in Nigeria, and it's uh, Give me a lot of insight, really, you know, taking a look at uh, your presentation a few minutes ago. Uh, what we have there has almost been taken over by this cartoon and uh, modern performances. And I was actually looking at uh, your presentation, prophet presentation, that uh, the tradition is it, it evolved from uh, a tradition and continues to be highly literalistic especially in this part of the world, Malaysia and other areas. So I'm like, do you foresee a possible drift from this rich uh, literalistic tradition or a trade by modernism, you know, to take it away from the aspect, aspect of, of uh, the presentation as you, you, you state it here, you know, in the nearest uh, 
future, and how can we check this possible drift? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nigeria fascinates me. Uh, it's an incredible culture. And in fact, when I began this work, uh, one of my main references was Wole Shirinka, who has done some incredible work in, in, in really, again, intellectualizing uh, the ritual traditions of the Yoruba uh, people. Uh, and just an incredible mind, that man, just, just you know. Um. But uh, what I've discovered, I mean, the question is a very interesting one, because it's, two things are happening. Uh, there are very interesting modern uh, things that are going on, animation being one of them. A lot of the puppeteers here, uh, um, you know, interesting thing about Malaysia is even as rural as you get, it's not very rural. <laughs> so everyone's got a handphone, everyone's got a like, video camera, and they do very interesting things. Uh, so they're starting to create, you know, cartoons and so on using uh, some very interesting uh, things that are being done. But I've also discovered that on the contrary, Rather than the fact that people are moving away from these traditions, they're coming back to them. Uh, because while people are getting interested in technology, and essentially that's where the interest is, in creating technology, there's, no, there's not as much, as much yet in Malaysia inventiveness uh, in terms of creating different you know, uh, um, uh, things. It's just using technology to, to create adverts and animation. Um, I find that uh, due to the um, processes, historical and political processes we've got, people have begun to discover that they lack soul, right? And they're coming back to these traditions for soul and for spirit. One of the interesting things with uh, Malaysian traditions uh, being essentially folk traditions and essentially being oral traditions is that you have uh, highs and ebbs constantly. In the 70s, for example, you know, people wanted to go to the cinema, so they didn't go to the to, to shadow puppetry. But then shadow puppetry became very interesting and started to use a lot of cinema influences within traditional shadow puppetry. And what's interesting in, in, in folk traditions, of course, is there's space for everything. There's space for ritual. There's always space for a lot of humor, and that's where the contemporary element comes in. You know, so Bollywood music is very popular in shadow puppet performances. Uh, Bobby and things like that, you know, still being performed. Um, so I'm, I'm not concerned that anything will happen in a, you know, for, in a permanent sense, that people will move away from tradition in a permanent sense. That can only happen with politics, from external forces who come and literally interfere uh, in the evolution. People's tastes go around in circles, you know. Uh, one of the great things I've discovered is that, you know, um, people are starting to collect LPs again. I was a great LP collector and still am, and, and, and these days, you know, that, that whole tradition has come back. Maybe not in as large a way, uh, but uh, it's, it is highs and ebbs all the time. So, I, no, I'm not that concerned. I, I've seen the contrary. I don't worry about it. Um, like I said, I began work with this. Now, you know, I, I'm a very uh, upper middle class boy. Uh, I come from a, uh, the, the metropolis. I come from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, my father was a, a professor at the university. So we were a very upper middle class kind of life. Uh, and I've never seen a shadow play. Now, I've heard of it, I've seen it on TV, you know, in, in cultural tourist things and whatever not. But I've never seen a, a Shadow play in in person uh, until this 
this event, uh, this this uh, uh, political event. So things come and go. Yes, they do, and we can't stop that. But uh, things that come with the hammer of legislation is a totally different thing altogether. Uh, and those kinds of things, I think, societies can't allow to happen. Uh, the state is. Um, I am politically an anarchist. I believe that the state is inimical and dangerous to all of us, and that we always have to approach the state in a very um, cynical and apprehensive way. Uh, you can't ever see anarchist society, but you can see it in your head, so that's how you approach politics. Uh, and whenever there is a whiff of uh, the hammer of the state coming down and saying, don't do this and don't do that, it is time to act. And very often it's, uh, also on a personal level, I think it's brought the best out in me. Uh, to really learn how to work around things in very ingenious ways. Uh, I like censorship. I think it's a very powerful artistic tool. Uh, you always have to fight it, but you, you know, uh, the, the, the Chinese filmmaker Zhang Yimou said, uh, you know, I, I have fought um, uh, censorship from the very beginning, but I will admit personally that it was my greatest creative tool because it made me look at things in, in a multitude of ways. You mentioned that in uh, Malaysia, Ramayana is called uh, the Epic of Ram. Uh, can you dwell a little bit more in the, on that, in the sense that was it just a <coughs> rationalization in the Islamic context, or was his avatar changed from the evil that we see him into some other role? Uh, we have a very strong relationship with Kamban's Ramayana. I think. In fact, the story, the epic of Ravana begins with Ravana uh, in, among the Malays. Uh, and Ravana is, again, you know, is mortalized, is mortalized. So he doesn't, in the Malay Ramayana, he doesn't have ten heads, but he has very strong thighs. Uh, because uh, to get all his power, he was suspended from, he suspended himself uh, from the, not the heavens, but, you know, the place in between heaven and, and, and the earth. He suspended himself on one leg for 240,000 years. So his strength comes in his legs. You know? And uh, it's quite interesting because in, in, in uh, most Ramayana traditions, you see that uh, the monkey army, uh, you know, one of their great feats is that they can leap. This is the same with the Malay Ravana. He can leap in, in very great uh, uh, things. And because he, he has great center of gravity when he stands, his thighs are. Uh, incredible. And that's also his attractiveness. People are drawn to his thighs. Um, so I think we have a, a, a strong uh, uh, link to Kamban's uh, Ramayana. But uh, added to that, of course, are very strong biases. Let me tell you how Ravana is regarded. He's regarded for all his faults as being incredibly, incredibly human. And the uh, secularization of the Ramayanic culture among the Malays is a very interesting one because it is seen as a very human play, a very human uh, uh, um, unraveling of affairs. And while he is a villain, right? even in the Malay tradition, he is a villain. He does all these dastardly things. But we sympathize with him. We don't agree with him, but we sympathize. And anyone who understands the Malay sensibility, which is very much rooted in the frailties of the human being, in pathos, in sadness. It's a very elegiac culture, uh, very elegiac, very, a lot of energy. Uh, we'll find uh, that it's very natural mm, that they sympathize uh, with him. There's no demonization of Rama. There's, you know, it's very strange. Uh, it's, it's a kind of irritation, it, it, as if he's, you know, as if he's just too good, too perfect. You know, and, and we don't like that. That is, that is uh, so annoying. Um, whereas Ramana is very, and of course. In some versions of the, of the, of the, of the Ramayana, in Kambans, uh, the Malay Peninsula, Yava Dipam, Yava Dipam uh, was known as the abode of, Ra of Ravana. It's where he brought all his girlfriends. Right? Uh, and of course, he's seen, Ravana is seen to be very, very attractive, dark, very handsome, uh, and uh, very seductive. 
and really, really quite irresistible. Uh, whereas Ramana is really popular. Uh, and Ramana is seen to be sexy, right? He's a very sexy character. <laughs> The last question. Yes, um, thank you for mesmerizing lecture. I just wanted to know if uh, you could elaborate or tell us a bit about other art forms other than puppetry that face similar such problems in Malaysia um, uh, from, from politics as well as identity issues. Um, it's a convergence of factors. It's uh, politics, which has brought about a forced cultural amnesia. <laughs> yeah. And the problem with halal haram politics is that communities literally, biologically feel unclean. It's a, it's a very strange phenomenon, it's something I'm really thinking to write about. That this sense of uh, puritanism gets into the blood. You know? It's there in the way people speak language. You know? And don't use this toothbrush. Don't use that toothpaste. That is, that is the language of religious politics uh, in, in, in Malaysia and many other countries. You know, don't use that. Uh, you know, recently we had a huge controversy about whether you could eat Cadbury chocolates because it might contain the pig DNA. Never mind about that. The solution, Cadbury has to pay for Muslims to have blood transfusions because we are that contaminated. Okay. This is the dialogue that happens on a daily basis. I'm one of those sadomasochists, I think. You know, every Thursday night we have these religious programs with uh, government-appointed ustas, ustas coming in. You should listen to some of the questions. They're unbelievable. You know, if we are in the desert and uh, yeah, there is no toilet and cleaning facilities, what do we use? I think to myself, we're in the tropics. <laughs> it rains all the time. Okay? Uh, I always refer to the contradiction as this. We are tropical people, sensual people. We sweat in our loins, but our mind is occupied by the desert. And imagine the uh, psychological trauma. Okay. Added to that, of course, then the band this and band that. A band culture, unbelievable. Man, okay? um, apart from puppetry, every single one of those traditions you saw there was banned, is banned. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, you look at the Kudagapang, uh, just the, the lineage itself, the historical lineage uh, of Javanese immigrants from Java, practicing a tradition, Shia tradition, that was very much Shias. Even if you, now, what is interesting is this: even if you were a Sunni, given a particular period in Islamic history, there were very strong Shia influences in Sunni culture.